Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to our Signpost Series webinar this morning. My name is Andy Boland, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we discuss and talk about another issue of farming in the environment. Uh, our series is brought to you in conjunction with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and the National Rural Network. And just to remind you that this morning's presentation, together with all of the previous presentations that we've had over the last nearly three years, are available on our Chagas website for you to download. Also, we do a podcast version, which is available wherever you decide to download your podcast. I'd also like to remind you as well that if you could use the Q&A function uh, to put in any comments or questions that you might have for this morning's speaker. So this morning, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by James Lusby from Birdwatch Ireland. And James is going to talk to us about how farmers uh, can help uh, barn owls. So good morning, J John. Sorry, John Lusby. Morning, John. No problem. And Thanks, Andy. I'm also Jane, uh, joined by James Milan. James is a colleague from the Tipperary region in Chagas. James is a dairy advisor based out of Clonmel. And James is going to give us a hand with the Q&A afterwards and keep an eye on the questions as they're coming in. So thanks for joining us, James, this morning, giving us a dig out. Thanks, Andy. So, John, um, if you uh, could tell us maybe uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, and indeed, perhaps a little bit about Birdwatch Ireland. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks very much, Annie. That, that was a relief. I, uh, I got a shock for a minute. I thought it was just me that couldn't hear you. So um, uh, glad, glad we got over that. So th thanks very much, Andy and, and, and uh, Chagas, for, for inviting me. To, delighted to be here for the Signpost uh, series. So, uh, so, so my name is John Lusby. I work with uh, Birdwatch Ireland. And we're the, the largest independent environmental organisation in the country. And we're dedicated to the protection of wild birds and their habitats. And uh, we, we, we do that through, uh, through a range of, of, of a variety of, of work through species and habitat conservation, as well as research and monitoring and policy and advocacy. And what I'm going to be talking about today, I, I think, kind of spans across all those um, areas. And we're going to focus on, um, uh, on, on barn owls. And I'm going to give uh, talk a little bit about the work that we have done, what we've learned about barn owls. I've been working on barn owls for, um, for, for almost 15 years now. Um, so, so, so quite a stretch. And over that time, we really have, you know, increased our understanding of barn owl populations in this country, but also as well what they require from a conservation pers uh, perspective. And uh, there's quite a few positives in the in the, the talk this morning because it, it's a species that we have seen um, a, a slow population recovery um, in recent times, and that's in no part, um, uh, in no small part, due to the conservation efforts as well as other factors, but. But definitely, um, you know, the fact that so many people and individuals and groups have come on board to try and to try and help barn owls and to implement conservation measures, and particularly farmers on the uh, on the ground. So I'm going to be talking a bit about that, a bit about some of the successes, but also some of the areas that we still need to, you know, to to, to improve upon. Um, so so I've I've titled the the, the talk how uh, how can farmers help barn owls, but maybe a more appropriate title would be how how farmers can help themselves as well by helping barn owls. And that's one of the, 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 the really positive things with barn owls is that any measures for, for barn owls are going to have, you know, knock on benefits for, for, for the landowner, for, for, you know, for other wildlife, for other biodiversity. So, so I think that, that there, there's lessons to, to, to learn from, uh, from that too and potentially apply to, you know, apply to other species um, and, and in other areas of conservation. So I'm hoping we're going to... Sorry, Andy, yeah? Yeah, thanks very much. You can just... You, you begin to share your presentation now, John, so you can fire away and begin your presentation. Yeah, can you see the presentation there, yeah? Yeah, everything's great, fine, great. yeah. Okay, so this is the bird that, that, that all the trouble is about, that, that all the interest is in, and I'm going to give a brief, just a brief introduction to the bird. I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with barn owls um, already, but just to give you a bit of background on, on the species. So this is mostly, if you're lucky enough to catch a glimpse of, barn, of a barn owl, this is mostly the view you get just from beneath and to see this beautiful, a uh, ghostly white um, uh, bird, very, very, and, and Irish barn owls are, are particularly, um, particularly white, particularly pale. Um, so absolutely magnificent birds, um, as you can see. Quite, quite rare to see because obviously they're nocturnal. They only come out um, at night. So it's often, you know, a quick glimpse. You know, often as it, you know, flies across the road, just you know, you, you catch a glimpse of it in the, in in the, the car headlights. Um, 
So but one of the things, if you do get a look at, at the Bernals, one of the things that is quite obvious immediately is the fact that they are a predatory bird. They're, you know, that they're, they're ju just by looking at them, they're, they're designed for, for hunting, for, for catching their prey, for catching small mammals. And there's a few, you know, um, really, really interesting adaptations that you see with Bernals. Obviously, the very um, the long legs, sharp talons, that's, you know, helps diving into deep, deep grass, deep vegetation to catch their, catch their prey, which is mostly small mammals, which I'll talk about. Um, they also have a really interesting adaptation of Bernals. They also have almost completely silent flight, and their wings are specially adapted um, to reduce the, the, the wind flow and the noise when, when, when they are flying. And that's obviously really useful because, you know, that means then that they're not making a lot of noise when they're flying, to, you know, which would disturb the, the prey that they're, they're looking for. But also as well, that they're not making a lot of noise, which means they can focus on listening for their prey. And that's actually their main hunting tool is that they got very, very acute hearing. And that's helped by this characteristic facial disc that they have, which, which looks beautiful, but it also serves a purpose, almost like a satellite dish, which helps funnel the, the sounds towards their towards their ears, which are ju just tucked behind that, that facial disc. And, and, and very, very large ears. You obviously you can't, can't see them, they're tucked behind the feathers, but um, very, very large ears for the size of the bird and, and really, really incredible hearing. And that's mostly how they, how they find and locate their, their prey. And this is mostly what they're what they're feeding on, and it, obviously brown owls as well, being a predatory species, being a top predator, um, that they they they're, they fill a really important role within the within the environment. Um, you know, they help to keep you know the likes of rodent populations in check, but also as well, it means that because they're a top predator, we can we can learn an awful lot about the the health of the you know the what the countryside by um, how brown owls are faring by by, by studying brown owls. And obviously, because they're right at the top of the food chain, they're going to be affected by anything that happens, you know, um, beneath them within the food chain. So say, for example, you know, a habitat loss, which might affect small mammals, that's you're going to see those effects, you know, within barn owl populations. But likewise, you know, you know, um, positive improvements in habitats, you know, again, you're going to see that reflected in barn owl populations. And we've learned a huge amount, not only about barn owls, but about, you know, the, the wider environment through that. Uh, to, to the work that we've carried out on brown owls, and, and I'll, I'll hopefully cap, ca capture a little bit about that. But as well as that, there's a whole range of reasons why brown owls are important, and um, and and, you know, and why they're important, particularly in, in Ireland. And um, it, they're they're an interesting species because they're 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 still a very rare bird in in Ireland. Still, a lot of people have never actually seen a, seen a brown owl, but they're instantly recognisable to, to to practically to, to almost everybody. And they're also a species that people. Just tend to, you know, gravitate towards people have a, you know, have a really special link with them um, with brown owls in Ireland, and there's a few, probably a few reasons for that, and and one of those is that they're so uh, closely linked to our mythology, our folklore, and um, they're one of the reasons behind the, the legend of the banshee, this lady that you know comes out at night and, and screams and 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 foretells um, death in the family, and you can imagine why when you hear the the barn owl um, screech and, and scream, the quite, quite eerie sounds. So imagine hearing that in, in, in the dead of night and, and not, knowing, not knowing what's behind it or what's responsible. So, so that's an adult, that's a screech. And then this sound that I'm going to play, this is the, if any of you have heard this, this is a pretty magical sound to hear in the, the summer months because this is the, the young barn owls. And off, it, a lot of people think, you know, associate the sound of an owl with, you know, that the yeah, the twit tw true, but that's not not at all what what a barn owl sounds like. And this is the call that I'm going to play. This is what we call snoring, and um, it sounds like snoring or hissing, which is the call of young barn owls. So if you hear this sound, you know that you know that there's young in the nest. That that that, that birds are doing well. And again, probably behind a lot of the the mix of haunted houses, you know, when you're hearing the strange sound, you don't know what's what, what's what's responsible, you know, you, you can understand why, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, led, uh, you know, stories about haunted houses, particularly own ruined, ruined derelict buildings, which barn owls typically, typically frequent. Um, another reason why they're very important is because of what they do, just as you can see here uh, in this image. And they, 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 have, they have been known as the farmer's friend, the barn owl, and there's very good reason for that. And as I, as I mentioned, there, you know, there, there are species that, you know, um, as soon as you start talking about barn owls to, to somebody, generally, you know, you see, you know, the face light up, you see people are interested. And 
if we go back a few generations, in the days before we had um, rat poisons or denticides, vernals were one of the best means of natural rodent control. And they were actively encouraged to nest on the farm and, and, and particularly in the farmyard because of the benefit that they brought in terms of um, you know, uh, catching and, 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 and feeding on um, rats and mice. And, and, and we've seen it ourselves from using nest cameras, um, for, uh, for birds can catch up to 25 rodents in a single night during the summer. So you can imagine, you know, just having them on the farm, that the benefits that that, can, that that can bring. And you see some of the older stone buildings, stone farm buildings as well, still have um, uh, some special access, you know, owl windows and special access to uh, encourage birds and allow them to, you know, to, to enter into the buildings and, and, to, and to nest in the, in, in the loft space or, or, or in other areas within the buildings. And, and, you know, the reason for that is, you know, it was seen as hugely, hugely lucky to have a, a pair of barn owls nesting on the farm or, or, or in the farmyard. And, and that, you know, um, that, that, that love for owls has, has, has definitely still, still maintained and, and still continued. Um, and probably another reason as well why that they're so well known is the fact that, you know, they're the emblem of the Late Late Show and, and you know, a, a huge portion of the population sees them every, uh, every Friday night um, on the Late Late Show. But I suppose from our perspective, there were, you know, that, that there are a lot of reasons why we wanted to, to focus on barn owls in particular and, um, and why we saw them as, as important to, 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 to learn more about them. And, and one of the main reasons for that was because we, we, we know and we knew that, um, that barn owl populations have struggled over recent decades and have declined quite, quite substantially over the past kind of 50, 60 years. And, um, and I suppose, you know, similar to a lot of uh, farmland birds, you know, the likes of, you know, curlew, corn crake, yellow hammer, a lot, a lot of species, you know, associated or dependent on, on farmland have followed a similar kind of the downward decline. So it's important to, to understand, what, you know, what's driving those, the, 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 those declines and what we can, can do about it to, you know, to halt and, and, and reverse those declines. So just to give you an idea here, this is um, a map from the Breeding Atlas which is a survey of, of, of all birds across Ireland and, and, and Britain. Um, and uh, it's, it's carried out every 20 years. So this is the, the results showing barn owl distribution from the first breeding atlas, which shows that, you know, population still, but no, birds are still very widespread, um, uh, you know, and but with, you know, particularly down the southwest, and, and that still remains the case. But if we fast track then another, uh, fast track 20 years on, we can see there was a huge um change and a huge decline in barn owls over that period and that was really the time that that they, they suffered most and that, that the population declined to its greatest extent and that was you know from the from the 60s onwards um more recently the most recent breeding atlas showed a, a slight increase but um very much you know in in munster in particular and also as well you know we, we also need to bear in mind that this was the time that we started really you know kind of um increasing the efforts and looking for barn owls and um, which probably played a part in in this as well um, but, uh, but 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 it all it all shows that essentially you know the population had declined and you know we, we needed to do something about that. So they are what we call a red listed bird of conservation concern. Um, so just like the traffic light system, red, amber, green, with red being those that we're most worried about that are that are most endangered. And the barn owl has been on the red list of birds conservation concern since the, since since we established this list in the first place. Mm -hmm. Hopefully over time we may be able to. Um, to, to, to remove the brown owl from the red list, but um, but, but I think that would be a, li a little bit of time to come. So I'm going to talk now about because I suppose before we talk about what you know what we can do to help brown owls and conservation measures, we, we need to know why they have declined in the first place and, and the factors that affect them. So um, so so I'll run through some of those that we now know from you know from from our research and, and, and from our um, from our monitoring and. W one of those is, well, well, I suppose, and they all kind of generally fit into, you know, the, the category of general changes, you know, um, in the countryside and, and also, you know, in, in, in intensification of agriculture. Um, but one, one of the factors um, that can affect barn owls and, and that has at least in certain parts of the country is the loss of, of, of nesting sites. And barn owls, just like, just like their name implies, they're very closely associated with, um, with farm buildings, with farmyards. And um, they that they would you know traditionally nest in old stone farm buildings. So as 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 we lose those types of buildings in the countryside, and as they're replaced by you know more modern buildings with less um, with less nesting opportunities in them, 
that can that, that can affect brown owls in terms of reducing um uh, uh you know the, the 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 nest sites that are available to them now the good thing about that is that this is something that's quite easy to to address by providing um purpose-built nest boxes and it's something that we've had and and through you know loads of um uh, 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 farmers that have you know taken the, the, these measures, provided nest boxes themselves. You know, it, it, it's really starting to show to show benefits, which I'll talk about. Um, which I'll talk about shortly. Another reason that, uh, or another factor that affects barn owls, and probably the one that that, that would be one, one of the most concerning um, currently is how barn owls are affected by the use of rat poisons or denticides. And um, I mentioned about barn owls being. You know the, the the important role that they play as rodent predators, and they can have you know there's huge benefits from that. But there's also the downside of that is the fact that they are very susceptible to being exposed to 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 rodenticides, to rat poisons, because of the fact that they you know feed to a, a large extent on rodents, on rats and mice, but other other small mammals um, as well. And the problems can occur um, where. The you know rat rodenticides are used, but they can be taken by by uh, rats or mice, and then if that uh, you know, if if that rat or mouse is then taken by a brown owl, these toxins that they they what's known as bioaccumulate, they can move up through the food chain, pass from one one species to the next, and um, and obviously with brown owls sitting at the top of the food chain, they are they, they are quite susceptible. Um, so we're we're actually currently carrying out, uh, carrying out work to look at you know uh, exposure rates in 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 barn owls from rodenticides, but we previously carried out work and um, the results were, were 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 not unexpected, but also um, you know really showed the extent of exposure and 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 and, and very very worrying. So out of the birds that we tested, um, sixty nine birds, um, the vast majority over eighty eight percent had detectable levels of rodenticides in their systems, which shows basically that the majority of, of the wild population are exposed to rodenticides. It, it's, not a, it's, it's not a problem that's restricted to brown owls alone. In fact, you know, the more we do, we're, we're increasingly, you know, advancing our understanding as to the, the, the widespread nature of um, contamination of rodenticides in the, uh, within the food chain, within the, the ecosystem. And, and then we know that, you know, right down the lower levels of the food chain, the likes of, you know, even invertebrates, they can be, um, uh, they, they can consume um, rodenticide base, they can be um, exposed, and then obviously they can pass it on to, to other species that, uh, that feed on them, likes of songbirds and, 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 and mammals, and, and, you know, all the way up to the, to the, to the top predators. So it is something um, uh, that that is that remains a, a, a real concern and something that we need to, that we need to do more about. And I'll talk a bit about some of those measures um, shortly. And another um, a factor which affects barn owls is um, road mortality is being killed on roads. And um, of, of of all the birds, they are by far and away the most susceptible to being hit, being hit on 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 roads and particularly major roads, the likes of you know fuel carriageway motorways in particular. Um, and one we, we've learned and we've carried out a lot of research in this area and we've learned that one of the reasons for that is because they're actually attracted to hunt along the, 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 the along the roadside verges and um, this might seem you know it's, it's somewhat separate to you know to in relation to you know kind of um, uh, farming and land management but it actually is very closely linked because obviously the birds are attracted to these two roadside verges for a reason and that's because they're you know that they're they provide really good habitat for small mammals you know they're full of these uh, these small mammals like great white teeth and shrew and wood mouse and bankfold and that's probably a reflection as well of you know the wider landscape and um, and the you know the, the the habitats available to brown owls in the wider landscape um but it's also something that we've managed to make some some progress on and um we have developed specific mitigation measures for brown owls for road for 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 um, major roads, which are now a requirement for all new major roads. So so that that is something that is you know that 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 is um, definitely positive, and um, uh, and we hope that it's possible to now retrofit some of the existing roads, which are um, is, remain very problematic, and particularly some of the motorways. But at least you know it, it's you know we're, we're moving in the right direction in relation to um, to, to trying to reduce the effects of. Uh, of, of mortality on roads, but but it does um, bring us to the, the and just as I mentioned, that's probably the most important um, factor that has affected barn owls over that period that you've seen the declines um, is the changes in you know land use changes and um, the loss of of, of of suitable foraging habitat 
I'm just going to show you a couple of short videos now, just to as better than I would um, capture it uh, myself, just to give you a visual of um, uh, barn owls and how they use the landscapes and when, uh, landscape and what habitats are important. So, um, a couple of years back, while researching, you know, um, this uh, the, 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 as part of our study on uh, looking at barn owls and, and, and major roads, we wanted to look at, you know, where birds went at night time, where they hunted, and um, uh, and, and you know what habitats were important for them. So this bird you can see here was fitted with a special GPS transmitter, which allowed us to to monitor their movements, you know, and in, ver in very fine detail, you know, um, as they were out and about at night and and, and hunting. And um, just to give you an idea, so this so, so and then we fitted, you know, uh, a, I think it was 15 birds with these GPS transmitters. This is just a very short clip which shows the movement of a sing of a, of a female nesting in this um, farmyard, and this shows her movement out and just if you focus on you'll see that the this she starts hunting here now and you can see she's essentially just focusing on the hedgerows um ignoring the you know the the the, the field the inside the, the interior of the fields and just focusing on the head, uh, hedgerows flying quite slow up and down the hedgerows then she comes to the edge of the motorway this is the m8 motorway and we know she then caught prey because then she flies in a in a, a, a quite fast in a more or less a direct line back to the nest site. And we saw that time and time and time again that um, you know the birds would have a large home range, but um, you know they could move six seven kilometers easily from their nest site. But they had very um, they, they had favourite foraging areas within that. So you know and obviously you could see there just how important the, the hedgerows were. Um, but also then, you know, certain, um, you know, other habitats like wild bird cover um, was, was really, really important areas of rough grassland. So it just emphasizes, you know, just how important, you know, hedgerow management is, but also, you know, um, retaining, you know, a more natural um, uh, uh, areas. And even if that's, you know, at small areas on farm, we could see that, you know, just how important that was um, for, uh, for the birds. And also you could see just the fact that they were attracted very much to the roadside verge because of the, 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 the you know, the rough grass margins that were there. Um, so, uh, but as, as I say, you know, so there are some of the factors that are affecting brownells, but in general, what we are seeing, and it's fantastic to see, is a, is a slow population recovery. And we're seeing, you know, brownells returning to areas that they haven't been for, for, for in some cases, you know, several decades. Um, and that, that's really, really positive. And um, the, so, so you can see the map here. It does, uh, these are all the barn owl nest sites. So close to 700 that we have um, uh, recorded through our, through our monitoring over the years. And you can see there's a very much, uh, you know, a, a bias towards the Southwest, towards Munster. And that's still, uh, and even when the population was, you know, it, it had declined, you know, quite significantly, Munster really, and you're talking kind of, you know, Cork, Kerry, Limerick, Tipperary, in particular, that was remains the the stronghold for barn owls, and um, and, and 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 it still does. And but but it's great to see that you know birds are starting to increase, you know, elsewhere and move, you know, kind of um, start, starting to this a slow but steady, you know, increase kind of further north and um, and east. Um, they're also a species that we rely heavily on um, uh, in relation to citizen science. So people are reporting information to us. So you know, um, farmers and, you know, uh, local community groups where, where they see a barn owl repeating that back to us. And that really helps us understand, you know, um, where birds are, the distribution of the population and build up a picture as to, you know, how they're faring in different parts of the country and, and where we might need to, um, you know, to invest further conservation efforts. Um, and uh, so, so, so just to give you an idea of the types of uh, places, the types of nest sites that they use, um, still very much barn owls are still you know um really uh, associated and really you know dependent on old rune stone structures such as this um, and and these are still you know the, the some of the most most common nest sites for barn owls um, and uh, i would say not only uh, barn owls but important for a, a huge range of other species like kestrels and swifts and the species of bat and um, uh, a peregrine falcon and a huge range of other um, of other wildlife so a really really important part of our um, of our countryside, <clears throat> uh, but for barn owls, one of the most um, important nest sites. But also as well, um, you know, uh, uh, farmhouses, abandoned farmhouses, and uh, uh, and farm buildings are hugely, hugely important. And um, that once there once there's a suitable nest site within these types of buildings, then you know you, that they'll use a whole different range of, of 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 nest sites within these buildings. So such as in the chimneys, or this is this is one here that we we um. 
filmed Byron Olds at um, fairly recently. This is an old water tank in the roof space that um, uh, is obviously dried out and the birds have made a, a very comfortable comfortable home there. Um, so this is two chicks in the in the, the old water tank in this farmhouse. And uh, you see this is, this is one of the adults coming back with prey. So it tends to reach fever pitch when the um, when the, the adults go back. But an important, important sound and sound to remember if you do hear it on the farm or if you do hear it close by, then now hopefully you'll know, you know what, uh, what's making it. Uh, but as well as, as well as building birds, we'll also use um, mature trees with hollow cavities. And... Um, uh, and where there are these nesting opportunities, then browns will happily happily move into uh, move into uh, to, to tree nests as well. Um, but probably most uh, most uh, most relevant um, in terms of conservation measures is uh, as nest sites is these as nest boxes. Now this is quite a quite an elaborate nest box, obviously on a pole, but um, it, they can be really really simple in terms of their design and in terms of their placement. And we've had there's it's it's been a huge success with um, providing nest boxes for brown owls. And um, we have done it ourselves to 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 a large extent, but also like a, a huge number of um of, of, of farmers themselves have, have put up nest boxes. And we're we're seeing every year we see an increase in terms of the number of pairs that uh, of brown owl pairs that use nest boxes. Last year, and I think we're 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 well over 150 pairs now using nest boxes, which is amazing. I remember when I started working on brown owls, there was two barn old nest boxes that were used in the, in the whole country that we knew of and um, whereas now it's, it's completely different and it's increasing every year and it's such a simple but such an important measure um to to, to undertake and, and can have real benefits but the real benefits we see are when the provision of nest boxes is also accompanied by by other measures related to rodent control and, and habitat improvement habitat enhancement there's a lot more elaborate um nesting sites uh, created um, for barn owls, but you, you don't need to to, to go to, the, to to this level of um of, of effort at all. You know, sometimes that you know the, the simple simple nest box can be can be hugely effective if you have if, if you have a suitable site and, and suitable habitat. Um, so just I, I just want to capture then the, uh, the 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 I suppose to give you an idea as to the the status of barn owls and how they're faring. And I'm going to focus just on a couple of counties because the the approach that we have taken in recent years is because. Because the population is increasing, and because um, you know, like they're 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 widespread around the country, it becomes quite a quite a challenge to you know to keep tabs and to keep monitoring you know on a national scale. So the the approach we've taken with support from local authorities and um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service is to focus on on individual counties in recent years, kind of focusing on three or four counties a year, trying to get as much information as we can on barn owls, their trends, you know, build up a picture of their distribution within those um, counties and then you know and, and then that serves you know really important resource we know where the nest sites are we know you know where protection measures should be implemented but just to give you an idea so this is um county galway obviously and uh the we carried out a survey here in 2021 and these this is the the results of the survey so the red squares are where we found uh, confirmed barn owl nest sites and the yellow is where we the uh, probable uh, uh, nesting but then the white is where we didn't record um uh, barn owls and you can see there's a very much a bias from east to west here with them, and and, and there's there's very little, um, very few barn owls as you go out, you know, kind of um towards uh, west of the county towards um Connemara. But you can see the east of the county, you know, very very widespread. Um, and just to, to give you an idea, um, this is the the map from uh, if we go back ten years ago, and this is our findings from from 2021. So over that period, you can see there was quite a change and quite a change in the right direction. So we recorded a 67% increase over the past 10 years in terms of barn owl range, which was which, which was absolutely fantastic to see. And, and that's reflected in all of the other counties that we actually focused on as well. Um, to give you an idea, this is the, the, the map of barn owl distribution from, uh, if we go back 50 years ago, essentially in the 60s. And um, so you can see it's quite similar, in fact, to what we found um, in 2021. So that, that's kind of telling us that barn owls obviously were much, were, you know, um, were widespread and were more abundant uh, going back, you know, uh, uh, 50, 60 years ago. And then obviously experienced quite a dramatic decline from the, from, from the 60s onwards. But now we're starting to see that slow recovery that I mentioned. And it's fantastic to see because obviously, you know, there's a lot of species that are, you know, moving in the other direction and are, you know, the, the, their status is getting even worse. So to see this, you know, um, 
slow population recovery with uh, with with brown owls is is hugely hugely positive. Similar situation in 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 Kilkenny, um, and it was probably even worse here in terms of brown owl numbers going back um, a few decades ago. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is again is from ten years ago to to more to to 2021. So a huge huge change in the right direction that we observed, and that is um. Uh, it's it's I would say the conservation measures that are implemented by landowners in the ground by ourselves they're they're, they're they are definitely helping um but uh, but there's also other factors and probably this is probably one of the main ones is that we think that the that the 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 arrival of, of this guy the greater white toothed shrew which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with and it's spread across the country seems to be benefiting uh, barn old populations and they seem to be as the as this um, uh, so it, it is an invasive species, an invasive small mammal. It was accidentally introduced to to Ireland and um, uh, initially discovered in in, in Tipperary um, uh, back in 2008, but has, has has since spreading very very quickly throughout the country. And barn owls absolutely love these; they, they feed to a great extent on them and um, where they occur. And we are seeing that as the great white the true expands its range. We're seeing, you know, the the, the fortunes of barn owls change in, in in these areas as well. And you know, where the where the great great white shrew still hasn't reached, you know, the we we we're, we're not seeing much change in barn owl numbers. You know, still occurring in very 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 low numbers. So it's a really interesting situation. And so 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 it's not it, you know the, the recovery isn't solely down to the conservation measures. But this does provide you know a really really good opportunity to make sure that we now implement the measures to make sure that. You know the population remains stabilized and that you know we're not having this conversation in five ten years time and talking about barn owl declines again so there's you know so, so it's, it's it's a really good opportunity and that there's been a huge surge of of interest and of you know a willingness to to you know to towards barn owl conservation um recently which is absolutely amazing to see and it's amazing to see the results of that um, and one of the, the instruments of that is that um, I'm sure some of you are aware there's um, there is a specific action for barn owls in acres, um, which essentially focuses on yeah you, know, you know and it's 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 not rocket science at all it's 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 quite simple and straightforward you know we know the measures that uh, that benefit barn owls and um, and one of them being you know providing a nest a nest box if you have a, you know a, a suitable location for nest boxes but also complementing that with um, improved road control practices, so so reducing or hopefully eliminating the risk of um, exposure to herbicides, but then also you know providing improving the habitat, providing suitable habitat, and if you can align those three elements, then you know, we've seen it time and time again that barn owls, uh, barn owls will thrive and barn owls will do well, and, and not only barn owls, but 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 a whole range of uh, you know uh, of other wildlife. So. Um, and so, so, so this is the the the, the barn owl action, but it's you know it's it's relevant you know regardless of whether you're you're in um, uh, the the agri environment scheme or not. You know it's um it's 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 you know that the, these are the measures that 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 work. Um, so just to give you a, a, an idea of it, so um we we, we developed quite uh, detailed guidance to um you know to try and inform the measure. So you know to to uh, inform, you know, firstly, you know, whether the whether your farm is suitable for this action, um, whether, and you know, and then if it is, you know, where the nest box should be sized, how to, you know, how, what what the nest box design is, how to um to uh to to install the nest box, how to ensure there's no disturbance, you know, um to the nest box, but also as well the other measures like improved road control um, practice and um and uh and improved um you know habitat uh, hab habitat enhancement and probably the last one is probably you know the most uh, the most difficult the most challenging but also the one that we want to see the most you know the most benefits of if it uh, you know if, if 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 that can be um if, if that can be implemented um appropriately um so the and again just to say if if I time I'll play a short a short video at the end from uh, from a farmer in Kilkenny but um who is uh, who is who is a much better spoke, a spokesperson for for for, for barn owls than I am because he he's someone that uh, you know that that's on the ground that he's a farmer and that he has encouraged barn owls onto his land and he's now seeing the benefits of it and um, he doesn't have to use redentalize anymore because the barn owls are doing all, all that work for him you know he he's he's you know he's he's incredibly passionate about the birds he you know he he's he's, he's almost watching them on a, on a nightly basis and uh, you know it just it just goes to show what can be done and and, and what can be achieved and just goes to show that you know these measures work as well and, and, and do have benefits.
But in relation to the Barnall Nest Box, as I say, it's not um, it's not rocket science. It's about you know identifying if you have a suitable a suitable location um, on the farm for a nest box, and if you do, it's 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 a really good way to encourage um, and encourage barn owls and to provide you know a safe, secure, suitable nest site, and that can be within a building, with, um, as you can see here, or alternatively, um, you know, I uh, think. Outside of a building, you know, um, uh, the gable end of a building or on a tree, as you can see here. And as I say, you know, we, we've, we've had, you know, the, the, there's, the, the uptake has been absolutely fantastic. And, and it can take some time. It can take a number of years before, you know, a, a box might become occupied. But um, uh, just the, the, the trend towards, you know, the, or the increase in the number of boxes that we're seeing be occupied is absolutely phenomenal. And, and I would imagine that this breeding season, we, we, we may... We, we may reach over 200 um, occupied nest boxes that birds are, are, are breeding in, which, which is absolutely fantastic. And that has other benefits as well. You know, it means that, you know, firstly, we know where the birds are. They're in nest boxes. Um, they, you know, there's probably less of a risk of disturbance or of, say, for example, you know, we, it, it, you know, every single breeding season, there's issues with them where birds are nesting in derelict uh, you know, or abandoned um, buildings and they, you know, might be, you know they might be renovated or or, or not, and 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 obviously there you know there's issues there. Then if, if if it's not known that the birds were nesting there, whereas with nest boxes, you know it's much easier to determine are the birds nesting there and to and and to and to, and to ensure that 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 they're safe as a result of that. Um, and then the uh, you know the 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 you know changes to to rodent control, and this is such such an important um area and one that you know would well, one that will have. You know, such wider benefits, not not just um, not only burn owls, but um, and I would say there's um, there's uh, the, the campaign for responsible rodent use has really really good. You've probably seen it. You know, and there's a uh, literature and guidance has been sent around to uh, to, to to I think all, all all farmers in the country. But um, that there is really good guidance in terms of you know the measures to take to improve rodent control, um, uh, and and then obviously habitat management. And um, and you know uh, habitat improvements, you know leaving space for um, for for wildlife, and that can be you know hedgerow management, leaving the you know the um, uh, wide verges. It can be you know we we've seen as well some of the measures like um, wild bird cover or I think winter bird food, uh, as I think the, the, the name has changed to is, is is really really valuable habitat for for barn owls and for other predators. So so you know the, the knowledge is there you know for what in terms of the habitat enhancement, but uh, it, you know it, it's about implementing that as best we can and, and, and we know the benefits that that will come from that um and i'm not sure andy how i'm doing for time there are we yeah we're <clears throat> maybe another few minutes we, i just we, there's a huge number of questions coming in john and okay. i would just like I, to try and get sure through them, so i just i just I, I might just play this video then if that's yeah. okay it's just a few few sure. minutes and then and then i'll i'll keep quiet we put up a box there just beside the other, the last year's nest, and moved out of that tree into the other, into the new box that we made. So it was great to see him going into the new box, but we weren't sure for a long time. And then I used to come out in the mornings here and I would find a pellet on the ground, a little pellet that the bird had regurgitated, and I knew they were feeding and they were, everything was going well then at that stage. So it was. We had them back. That was fantastic. So it was. Well, there's two chicks in the nest box this year, um, but they're in and out there the whole time, and we've uh, we've seen them going in with food into the birds, uh, into the chicks in the box. I've I've been out in the yard in the night time, and you don't hear the birds flying, but I've seen something going over my head, and it's just gone. And it's, you know, I'm actually, when I go out in the night time, I'm going like the owl itself looking around in the sky now, so I am. Because you, you just kind of get more conscious of the birds in the, in, the, in the surroundings when you're used to them. But you'd hear them every night squealing in the background. We can hear them when we're in the bed. Squealing so we can. We leave the window open a small bit and we can hear them. You'd know when the mothers come with food because they'd be, they'd be I can't describe the screech of it. We'd be there, oh, there she's there again. That's the way it is. But uh, it was like uh, a film for us because we could sit in the couch in the kitchen looking at them and we used to knock off the telly and just sit all night looking at the, the birds with their head out because sometimes the sensor light of the house would come on and it would brighten it up and you'd have a great view of them. It was, 
it was the best entertainment, it was the best seat in the house. Most nights you'd see something, so you would. You'd see them glimming in the, in the background. It's fantastic. It's, it's hard to describe what they're looking at because it, was, it is special to see it now. One night they were out, uh, it was about half, half eight, nine o'clock, and we were able to see them and they were bopping and they were like they were at a disco bopping around, so they were. But, but that night in particular, it was fantastic now to see it. So it was. But the minute you come out the front door, they, they fly away. The, the older the mother or, or the father or whoever it is, it fly away. But you, before we go out, you'd know, oh, they're out there. You could see the, the bare shadow or the, the whiteness of them. It, it was fascinating that they came so near. And like, we were in and out the whole time, and they never minded us. And I, I, in the wintertime, I'd be walking in and out or during the springtime, and they never minded me at all. The head would be twisting sometimes when they'd be looking out at you. But they, I think they got climatized to us as we did to them. So it is. But... The, I myself, since the owls came here, I'm farming and I give up using rat poison. And since I give up using the rat poison, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be run over. But i done it for the owl's sake. But we actually have less rats, I reckon, myself, since we started giving up the poison. And I used to use two buckets every year. So it's nature coming back to itself, I think, balances itself out if people leave it to themselves. Now, I'm going to just leave it there, Andy, just if, if we're tight for time. But uh, you, can, you can check out that video and others on, on, our, on our YouTube channel. But, yeah, I think you're eager to get to the questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there with the video. Lovely, John. You might um, just stop sharing with yeah. us there and uh, you, you'll come back into focus. John, um, thank you so much for that presentation. I mean, uh, the I don't know whether it was the Bush Telegraph or the I owls that were moving, but... It's one of our few webinars where the, the numbers that are watching have actually constantly increased right up. So the, there was obviously someone saying there's something good going on. Um, and we've had a lot of comments in Can um, I don't know whether you'll be cursing us or giving out to us after this, but there's an awful lot of people wanting to make contact with you, um, looking for clips of videos and all the rest of it. So we'll pull all those together and um, we'll send you all, the, we'll send you a full list of the Q&A because we're not going to get through the, the amount of questions that, that sure, we have. Sure, yeah, yeah, no, of course, yeah. yeah. But, um, just one thing, but while James is looking through some of the questions, um, rodent control, which is obviously key to um, you know the the life of the of, of the the, um, the owl. Uh, you, you, you'd love to get to the ultimate where you're not using it, but, but what's the best way of actually getting there? You know, you, I presume you just can't suddenly stop on some commercial farms and then you know hoping that your owls will take over. You know, what, what's is there a good plan? simple plan that you know people could follow to get from A to B. There is, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's very good guidance, um, as I said, on the campaign for responsible dentistry use about how to how to you know improve rodent control practices. But I suppose to, to be honest with you, like it's um like you you captured it well there, like you know, it's um it's 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 about making that transition from you know I think you know a lot of people are just used to to, to using rodenticides and um and, and one of the issues with rodenticides is that they are easy to use. They can be effective in terms of, you know, uh, uh, controlling um, rats and mice. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's more, it's moving towards kind of reducing the need to use them in the first place. And then that can take, you know, changes, you know, around the farmyard, you know, to reduce the suitability for, for rats and mice, you know, in terms of storing foodstuffs, less of, you know, less food available for, for rodents, but also then as well, like taking the measures that um, maybe require a little bit more work than using uh, rodenticides, but re very much reduce the, you know, reduce the, the, the risk to wildlife. And that can be, you know, shooting, it can be trapping and um, ultimately moving towards a more natural balance of you know say you know predators doing the doing the work that they should be doing like barn owls and like other predatory species that they're controlling the rats and mice but i think that um like even if you know there is a you know even if people are using rodenticides like there's you know there are but there are there are better ways of even using the rodenticides. I think one of the one of the, the 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 problems that we face is that um you know they're they're readily available, they're easy to use, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So you might just put out the rodenticide and then kind of forget about it. And one of the you know one of the things is that in in many in many cases you know there might not be firstly a need to use rodenticides, um and then as well we're also 
you know, r- r- you know, we need to bear in mind that once renenticides are out there and used, that firstly, that you know, it's not just the, the target species, so so the brown rat and house mouse that can be affected, it's a whole range of wildlife. But but as well as that, what we're seeing is that um brown rats in particular, that there's there's risk of them developing resistance to renenticides, and that's happened in the past. And with that, then it means that you know it's almost a race to the bottom. You know, we need to continue to develop you know more toxic uh, renenticides. Which you know, in order to control rats, but the but the flip side of that is that you know more toxic renenticides, the risk to to other wildlife is greater. So it it is it does take you know um you know increasing your awareness of the measures to to, to implement to you know in terms of rodent control and 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 there's there's no there's no getting around it. It does take um you know a a, a bit more effort than than just you know putting out renenticides. But I think you know we all need to be moving in that in in that direction and. And just even in terms of you know, you know, food production and all, like to move away from that, you know, dependency on you know these chemicals and on, and, on, and on toxins is definitely um, is, is definitely moving in the right direction. But um, John, the but, other but, thing, sorry, the other thing that has come in is the sighting of nest boxes. Like you know, say you can have a commercial farm that has no stone buildings, or you know, I mean, um, and then you can have some farms that have a mixture of both. I presume equal. You can you can have them in a woodland or whatever. What, what's the best place or to for sighting the the bird box? Yeah. The, so so yes. Yeah, so, so we found the 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 best place or the highest chances of success is if you have um, a, a building on the farm, and particularly like you saw some of the um, you know the the, the birds in the sheds that are, that are shown in the photos so if you have a building that's you know and, and you can have it in a fairly quieter part of that building then that's generally one of the best sites and um, locations but 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 if, if you don't have a suitable building then um typically you know uh, uh you know uh, a, a, an old tree mature tree that that can be ideal as well and you want just you know facing out onto open habitat you know kind of in an area where there's not a lot of coming and going there's not not a lot of disturbance and um, yeah, and and, and there and, and and generally, you know, most farms would have you know one or other of those um, uh, of those options available to them. Now there are that there are also you know not I would say not not every farm is suitable, and you need to bear that in mind as well. And say for example, you know farms that are you know quite close to a major road, then you don't, you don't want to be sighting nest boxes there. Or if they're you know farnals aren't really you know if if you're fairly high up like farnals aren't really you know they're more a lowland farmland bird like um but but also as well if if there isn't any suitable habitat around then it's, it's you know it's it's not great to you know to to cite an box to to encourage birds and, and I would say just to add to that like we have quite that there's we we've made some some videos which basically go through all of that and show examples of suitable habitat unsuitable habitat and all that and all that is on the the guidance that we developed for for, for the the Barnall action in acres so, so so if anything there if, if, if you know to definitely check that out if people are considering um you know uh, uh, putting up a Barnall nest box or or if they're they're wondering you know whether their farm is suitable or not. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, there's a, an avalanche of questions there coming in. Yeah, they're still coming in. Um, so, John, maybe just to start from, maybe this one is might be fully related to the talk today. But um, you mentioned the, the list of birds that were on the different conservation lists. Um, how where do peregrine, peregrine falcons appear in that list um, yeah. of endangered birds? Yeah, very good, very good question. So Peregrine Falcon um, is another one that uh, would have and declined to even a more a more uh, significant extent to, to Barnolds if we go back a few years for, for, for somewhat different reasons, more for um, uh, particularly DDT, piece of uh, organic learning, uh, DDT would affect the peregrines. But they're, they're another bird that's actually going in the right direction. We've seen their population recover. They're actually on the green list um, because of that, because of that, 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 that recovery. So peregrines at the moment, we're starting to see, you know, they're, they're still, you know, they're still a rare bird, but um, compared to a few decades back, uh, you know, it, it's a much more positive situation. And we're actually seeing now, just linking it to Brian we're actually seeing, you know, quite a few of those types of old ruined structures like castles and, and, and you know, and, and churches and abbeys that peregrines, you know, are, are starting to colonize them. But, but in general, you know, that they're, they're, they're not without their, you know, that they're negative effects. And, you know, there is, you know, unfortunately, incidents of persecution of, of peregrines, of shooting, of poisoning. But, uh, but, but in general, you know, at population <laughs> level, their their peregrines are starting to, you know, are, are you know, uh, slow, slowly recovering after 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 many decades of decline. And they are on the green list of, uh, of, of, of birds conservation concern. John, Mike wants to know um, why are, why are Barnows doing so well? In Munster and not so well in the north her- northern part of the country. 
Yeah, re re really good question. So um, we think that it's um, it's kind of at least one of the the fact that the main factors is related to um, these introduced small mammals or invasive small mammals as they are, which is one the greater white tooth the true as I mentioned, and the other one is the bank bull. And they're they're both species that they're not native to Ireland. They were accidentally brought over. And um, the bank fold was brought over to uh, to, to Foynes in West Limerick accidentally. It was actually, uh, it, it hopped on board um, a shipment of machinery that was brought over to Foynes that, 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 to, to, for um, Ordnance Russia to, to build uh, the hydroelectric dam at the time. This was in the 20s, the 1920s. Um, but anyways, they, they, they established, they, they, they um, uh, and since then have done, have done very well and have slowly increased the range. Now they uh, occur throughout Munster and, and into most of, you know, parts of Leinster and Connacht now. But I think that was one of the reasons that Bernal's had an additional prey item in Munster, you know, whereas most of the rest of the country didn't um, during that period of decline. And then more recently, the Greater Whitefield, the True, ha has arrived. And they seem to, they, 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 both of those seem to, to, to be of benefit to burn owls where they occur and burn owls feed to, in fact, they're, they're the two most common prey items for burn owls where they occur. So I think that that's part of it. And um, possibly, you know, and we're still learning about this, but possibly linked to that, if you think about it is that, um, you know, where burn owls are feeding on those species, they may be less likely to be exposed to rat poisons or to rodenticides because they're, you know, because they're feeding less on brown rat and on house mouse, so it's possibly, you know, related to that as well. But but also, I'm sure there, there's other factors like, you know, the the you know the, the, you know, the foraging habitat availability and you know, say so parts of you know, say you know, Kerry, if you can imagine, you know, with um, smaller field sizes, you know, um, uh, hedgerow networks compared to you know more intensive areas. You know, and, and, and that undoubtedly would um, would, would benefit barn owls as well. So I think there's a range of factors, but definitely in there is that the these introduced small mammals, the, the bank hole and the and the greater white tooth and true. John, so um, I'll find I want to know: Will long-eared owls use barn owl nest boxes also? Uh, very. Uh, not, not typically, no. Now, it's not to say that they wouldn't, but um, the long-eared owls, and, and uh, they have a different sort, sort of uh, nesting requirements. So they actually, well, firstly, neither barn owls nor long-eared owls build nests themselves. So um, barn owls obviously are a cavity nesting species in the nest, say, you know, as you saw, like um, down deep down chimneys and room buildings or, you know, in a cavity, a hollow cavity in a tree or, or, a, or a purpose built nest box. Whereas long-eared owls, they actually take over an old stick nest. So say for example like a, a hooded crow a gray crow or a magpie would build a nest they would use it one year and then the, the, the longer owls would move in in the next year um, and, and that they wouldn't they wouldn't build a nest themselves so 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 they're an open stick nest uh, uh, species and um, so they typically wouldn't use uh, wouldn't use barn owl nest box they're not a cavity nesting species like that but um, but a really interesting species that they're you know uh, they're 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 as, as owls go they're they're relatively common but they're just you know they, they people you know it's very difficult to, to know where to see and to, to know if they're if they're in your area. Um, they yeah, they very much go under the radar, but a, a fantastic species as well, the long area. Um, okay, so uh, I suppose you've addressed maybe the, the issue of rodenticides. So there has been a few questions on how do the levels um of high levels of rodenticides affect barren owls. Um John from living, he's living up north and he just wants to know he's there's not many barren owls in these areas. In his area, but would it be still worth installing barn owl boxes in that location? He's got grassland, woodlands, plenty of old buildings, and also a lot of hedgerows, mature hedgerows on his farm. Um, yeah, um, so in, in relation to the rodenticides first, so to be honest, which uh, we, we don't have a good knowledge of how rodenticide exposure affects birds, you know, at, at an individual level. So um, what we saw so um, from the birds that we tested was that um, we could see from the, the post-mortem and all that a small number of those had died from rodenticide poisoning, but the majority of them were birds that were, you know, um, killed on roads and that were killed for other reasons than rodenticide poisoning, but nevertheless, you know, it had rodenticides in their system, in their systems, and, and and for many at quite high concentrations. But it's very difficult to understand, to, to you know, to, to understand what effect that has on an individual bird. So obviously, you know, it's not good, and you would suspect that you know it affects their their general fitness, their you know ability to to, to hunt and to breed. But it's um, but but yeah, we 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 just don't know. It was a very difficult thing to study in in you know, in a wild population. Um, the, the there was a study carried out recently and was one of the first to actually link 
relenticide exposure in a predatory bird to population declines, and that was over in Scotland in relation to kestrels. And that was very that was uh, published this year, um, and it, as I say, is one of the first. So it, it, you know that kind of indicates you know that the, you know I suppose that the the, the concerns and the risks that relenticide you know exposure to relenticides in wild birds that the, the effects that they, that it can have on them and on, and on the population. And we would suspect it's the same with barn owls, but I can't say that we have really definitive information on that. So, um, uh, and, and in relation to the, um, oh, sorry, the nest box uh, up north, yeah, so um, so, so there's a, a Ulster Wildlife Trust in Northern Ireland who carry out a lot of work on barn owls, but uh, the, yeah, the, 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 uh, uh, John is dead right, there is, there's very few known pairs in the north, but I would say that the pairs that are there, there is, um, most of them are in nest boxes, um, so it's, I, I would say that where barn owls occur in very low numbers, that, you know, obviously the chances of uptake of nest boxes is, is, is going to be lower than, you know, than obviously, you know, in areas where there's a lot more birds around. But I would say that as well, that we have seen um, that, you know, in, 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 and I think, you know, Ulster Wildlife Trust and, and others, um, you know, would, would agree that um, um, there's, a, there's, there's another uh, a, a guy that does a lot of work in, in, in Antrim as well and in Down, um, uh, uh, wee man, he's, no, he's known as, but he, he would have done a lot of work on barn owls as well. And I think, you know, I think there would be general agreement that there's quite a, a, a limited availability of nest sites in terms of old room buildings. And so because of that, then obviously, you know, nest boxes can play a really important role in, in that providing nest boxes. So while there might be fewer birds around, there might also be fewer nest sites around and therefore, you know, still value in, in, in providing nest boxes. John, just we're getting near um, half ten. Um, and just maybe to, to wrap up, there is a good few comments there. Of where do you get um, nest boxes? And uh, actually, we've had uh, comments as well from the, the men's sheds that they are willing and able to, to make Great. nest boxes. So um, we'll try and pull all of that stuff together and, and send it on to you. And it, it might be of some use to um, to you or even there's a few people there specifically wanting bits and pieces that you might be able to, to get back to. Um, John, thanks very, very much for that presentation. It was a wonderful presentation with a mix of sound and uh, and video. Uh, and thanks very much for the effort that you went to, to, to put that together. James, thanks for going through all those questions. <laughs> um, we didn't get to a fraction of them. No. Uh, and apologies for that. But we, we will pass as, uh, all of them on to John. Next week, um, we're going to be looking at uh, actions for pollinators on farmland. Uh, and we're going to have Ruth Wilson from the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Um, so that, again, should be a very interesting presentation. And I hope as many of you as possible can join us for that. Um, just really to thank uh, James as well for, for going through all the questions and thank Yvonne Maher in the background for putting the show and keeping, the, keeping us all on the, the straight and narrow. So until um, next week, I hope you can all join us again. So have a, a nice and a safe weekend. And hope to see as many of you as possible again next week. So thank you all very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andy.